The highwaymen are a cultural phenomenon of Florida, and yet their influence has spread far beyond the expectations of those young African Americans living in Fort Pierce in the 1960s who discovered that they could make a good living selling landscape paintings. The highwaymen were largely self-taught artists. They began using inexpensive materials and then sold their art from their cars, driving up and down the highways and stopping in doctor's offices or at motels. From such meager beginnings, many members of the group became accomplished and well-known landscape painters, such as Robert Butler, George Buckner, James Gibson, Hezekiah Baker, and Marianne Carroll. Though there is a long tradition of artists traveling from the north to paint the beauty of Florida, few Floridians had participated in this tradition until the highwaymen. Therefore, they literally defined the regional art tradition in Florida. That these artists were also African Americans, for whom there were few opportunities and expectations in the Florida of the 1960s, makes their accomplishment all that more extraordinary. This is the story of the highwaymen. I'd go around and sit around there, maybe painting him and the guys, and one day I guess they wanted some money. So they said, he said, uh, I need to go sell some pictures today. You know, I said, but I, said but I don't have a car. So it was him, the two Stoke brothers, and uh, I don't know who the other gentleman was. But I said, I'll take you. I have a car. I said, you help me sell mine. I said, okay, so I rushed home and got my, I think I had about five paintings, and and then I went back over there to pick them up, all of them was ready, we loaded the car, we took out, went up to Melbourne, and we went to uh, some lawyer's offices and some doctor's offices up there, but one of mine was the first one sold, the one of mine that they were laughing at, but it was the first one sold, so this was my first ordeal, I think I made about 70 some dollars that, that day, and uh, man, I thought that was... I really, I don't know, I just was, I was very happy about it, but I didn't have any sense of values that just how much it was, you know. He said, when are you going to start to sell it? I said, um, anytime, I, you know, I don't know what to sell them for. He said, well, I sell mine for $50, you know, a penny. I said, you do? Man. So that's what started me to go out to try to sell it. So I went out and I'm hollering, $50. <laughs> uh, People said, we just bought one for somebody else for 25. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to drop my price. Don't sell them too high. Just where everybody can afford them. That way your name will be spread. It takes a long time, but it spreads more paintings, the more word of mouth, and more people want to see your paintings. And that's the way I did it. We all came through basically at the same time. I was in there doing the same thing, working with the same material and mm -hmm. and out there uh, uh, trying to make a living at it, right along with them. And I would say up and down the highway, selling them in some of the same places. Mm -hmm. we, a lot of the time we used to meet up at some of the same places. I would uh, take five, ten paintings in my old beat up 60 station wagon, ten dollars in my pocket to buy gas with. And I knew I had to sell a painting before I could come back because, you know, it's like a one-way ticket out somewhere with the, with the guests. And uh, sure enough, I was, I was always successful. And uh, yeah. as I look back on it, this response that people had toward all of us was just, was just fantastic. Well, the High Women, uh, we chose that title because of their method of selling their paintings. They would they would paint, sometimes there would be two or three artists painting together, but then they would just take them, often still wet, uh, put them in somebody's car and travel up and down the highway selling them. They would go to professional offices, hotels, barber shops, wherever they thought there was a market or appreciation for Florida landscapes. And the price was always pretty steady, 25 to $35 for a 
24 by 36 painting. So uh, from that standpoint, I, you know, and I'd have to say that uh, there were several of them that uh, kind of had a highwayman mentality. They didn't have swords and uh, flintlock pistols, but uh, they could be bad actors if they wanted to be. I didn't like the name of highwayman when I first came up because I told them, I said, well, you know, the reason why I don't like it for the fact that the highwaymen was a group, of, a group of thugs who used to steal and rob stagecoach to take the money and give it to the poor. I thought, this doesn't seem right. And then the more articles I read, I say, well, maybe it is a fitting name for them because they did travel up and down the highway. Now, I look at it that way. There's a lot of nasty rumors that they say about the highwaymen uh, that just aren't true. They're, they're a significant portion of Florida's 50s and 60s history. They're, they're, uh, they were people who learned to do something that not everybody can do, and that's paint and uh, then they learned how to go out and sell them. We sold every day that we went out, we sold a painting or two. And if we didn't sell but two paintings, that, that was good. That was like $70. Mm -hmm. so. And there I go, uh, up the, up Highway 27. And in the meanwhile, I'd stop in a few more offices, you know, and, and offer the work. And um, without fail, I'd find some of the highwaymen had already been there, you know. <laughs> These paintings were everywhere. And I think, uh, Quite a few of the people in the regions where we all travel uh, had had the experience with the guys who came before me, mm -hmm. so they were, were familiar with it, you know. And I'd get I'd get an audience from them. They looked, and a lot of them would buy. There was a lot of discrimination at Okeechobee at that time, and uh, a lot of people feared the road, but I I never feared it. We were nervous when I first started, but the people that I came across were nice people. I had no problem with them. They were enjoying my painting as much as I enjoyed them having it. I would get on the road traveling anywhere in the world I wanted to by myself, uh, at night or day, you know. The only thing I think, during some of those times, I had a gun, a few times, but not all the time. Basically, I was barehanded. But then I had one that somebody had sold me or whatever because they needed some money, and I just kept it in the car. You know, if you get out somewhere, it might see a snake or something that, uh, on the road at night. But I have never, I never even wondered what would happen from a car breakdown. At least for me, during the 60s and 70s, there just absolutely was nothing but we would go in, present these paintings. People would say, you know, these, gee, these are beautiful, or I've got a friend who might be interested. There was a, mm -hmm. there's really that kind of atmosphere. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Only now, when I look back on it, I said, how did that happen? You know, how did yes. things really go so smooth in view of the fact that there was so much turmoil uh, in the, in the mm -hmm. 60s and, mm -hmm. and early 70s? And the first person who bought my painting was uh, Dr. Sims. He was a dentist. The doctor knew I was uh, at training during that particular time with the colors and stuff like that. And that's when I decided to be an artist. I stopped by this little motel. Went inside and talked to the people that came and said, yeah, let me look at them. They were interested. So I lined the paintings up around the car. And that's when they pick out the five paintings that was my very first painting that was sold. And I was excited. I was just laughing all the way back. <laughs> you know, full with joy knowing that I, that, you know, I did that. I copied that from a calendar. Mm -hmm. That was back in the 60s too, uh, when I when I first started. I uh, well, sure, I don't know. I, I think I was I was a lot of struggling through there. Back then, I didn't I didn't know how to mix no paint or nothing. Mm -hmm. I all that stuff most was straight from the tomb. <laughs> all the colors, if you look at them, I mean, it's everything is straight from the tomb. There's nothing mixed down or nothing. Uh, Back then, I didn't know nothing about none of it, the area or the color or nothing. If it hadn't been for the, uh, the picture on the calendar, I'd have been in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I had two big pieces of board. I used an Upson board. And I I didn't know you primed the board. I knew nothing of what I was doing. I was just doing something. I had a fan. It was a church fan. Had a picture of Jesus on it when he was at the at the at on the rock praying. And I did that. And it, 
I thought it came out nice, you know, with no instructions, you know. So. For me, drawing was like breathing. I just did it. I have drawings that date all the way back uh, to maybe the second, third grade, when I would, I would be up on the bleachers drawing the kids who were playing uh, in the playground. So for me, it was not a passive kind of interest. It was an interest that had to do with breathing and existing psychologically as a person. I, I could feel good when I drew. I always, always enjoy art and always did, you know, did water scene, watercolor paintings, but it was more for myself than it was anyone else. And from that point on, I didn't have anything else to do and just had this course on TV. It said the 12 famous artists, a famous art school. So it was a corresponding course, I took that. And from that point on, I was drawing. It's just through trial and error, you know, just kept working at it until, uh, until I was able to, uh, you know, pick up uh, some of the things that uh, I was really looking for. And then through that, uh, you know, you, you go so long and then all of a sudden, bam, that, that happens for you, you know. You, I know in some cases uh, I even I even questioned it. I said, "Boy, what did I do then?" You know, mm -hmm. uh, it all happened through uh, trial and error. This guy took me in his house and showed me a painting done by a man named A. H. Alderman who traveled through that area and painted. And uh, I either said directly to him or to myself that you know, I think I can do that. But, you know, so he bought me eleven a uh, an eleven dollar. Uh, permanent pigment oil set. Had all the little oils and brushes and everything. So off I went to start painting. They had a hospital there. It's a big hospital now, Meharry Medical Center. And I had a little little job over there. I just sketch During this time, they didn't have the copy machines and stuff like that. You know, I just sketching diagrams of a person's arms, their veins, and stuff like that. I had a pretty good job in the afternoon. That's when it really got to me. And I stayed here. I saw my first painting. Okay, my name is Gladys Hare Bennett. I'm the sister of Alfred Hare, uh, who's one of the highwaymen. He loved to paint. I remember when uh, he was in about the, maybe the ninth grade. Uh, Someone reported to my mother that he was skipping school and that was a no-no in our family. You did not skip school at all. There were seven of us and my mom said, you don't skip school at all. Uh, it was reported to her that he was skipping school uh, to watch Harold Newton paint. And I remember Harold Newton used to paint um, different places, but one place in particular I used to remember, I remember was uh, on Avenue D. And my mom really didn't want Alfred to go there, but he, he used to, to skip school and, and watch him paint. Uh, Miss, Miss Jefferson saw the potential in Alfred and decided he needs some, uh, some training. So she asked Mr. Backus if he would help train Alfred. Bean Backus is known as the Dean of Florida Landscape Painters. Uh, Bean was painting Florida landscapes when they weren't in. It was just what he did. It was his calling and he did it very well. But he was mentor and model for probably all of the people that are painting Florida landscapes today. It would be hard to escape Bacchus's influence. I uh, told Mr. Bacchus that, you know, we didn't have any money to pay for the art lessons, but uh, maybe we could work something out, you know, with him. And Mr. Bacchus decided maybe Africa can come in, take some lessons, and maybe help with the frames uh, of the pictures that he was painting. And this is how Alfred started his training with Mr. Bacchus. I, I must say that I've never talked with anyone that had a bad word to say about Bean Bacchus. He was uh, a humanitarian, everybody loved him. And so he was a natural kind of a magnet for these young black men uh, who had limited resources, particularly in the white community, and they just kind of flocked around, gathered around. I just loved to be around Mr. Bacchus. I just thought he was a great man, and he took out time during this particular time, took out time for blacks. And uh, I guess he saw this coming in the future. And he just, just like he teaches other students, he told us what to do. I saw one of Beanie Backus's paintings, and I knew right away no one could ever paint Florida like Beanie Backus could. 
and really enjoy his work, enjoy his style. And he became uh, a role model where the landscapes were concerned. Anybody that had a little talent, he wanted to bring it out. Whether you're black or white, he just let you come. And uh, he always had time for you. And money wasn't his goal. Yeah, he expressed what he saw in nature and just put it out. I went to Bacchus um, also and to talk with him about some lessons. But at that time, I was working at the bakery, and I was about 20-something years old. He told me I was a little, a little old so I, did that. <laughs> so I didn't, I had to prove that he was wrong. But Mr. Back had a special place around here in the back, on the side, on the west side of the uh, building, where he displayed his painting after he completed. What he did was set the painting back from the window and held it down a little bit so you can see the shadows and all. And you should see the people riding by, putting on brakes, turning around, coming back. It, it was amazing how you got people's attention with this uh, particular window. Alfred Hare had a, apparently had an entrepreneurial spirit and he was very close to Bean. In fact, it's my understanding that, that while a number of these artists would tell you that they took formal lessons from Bean, they probably just hung around and learned by osmosis, although which I'm pretty confident that Alfred did take lessons from Bean. He was teaching Alfred Hare, and uh, Alfred Hare taught me what Mr. Backus taught him. Alfred Hare and, and uh, Harold Newton were the kind of the godfathers, the grandfathers. They were, they were young, they were in their 20s, but they were the ones that were really getting a name for themselves. He used to have quite a few people in my mother's backyard uh, watching him paint. And he did it with such skill, you know. Uh, I don't know. I know I couldn't do anything like that, you know. Uh, he's just, uh, he knew how to mix the paints. You, uh, I remember quite a few used to come over and watch him paint. Uh, like I say, Hezekiah is one of them. Um, and there were several others. Mary Ann Carroll used to come over and watch him paint. I could draw all my life from a little girl. I was drawing, but I never knew anything about color, the colors like the oils. Mm -hmm. I thought everything was pencil, you know, and when I seen things like Mona Lisa back in those days, I, it, it didn't really register. I thought cameras did all that stuff, you know. I didn't really know humans did paintings, and so then when I saw Harold doing it, that's when I realized it was real, you know. Well, I did a lot of portraits, you know, of uh, charcoal, and was doing that real good. And one day I showed it to one of my friends on a job. And he said, why don't you go talk to Alpha? And uh, I said, no, Alpha, we don't have time to talk to me. <laughs> so he said, go ahead on, you know, and show him, show him your work. So I did. I went by there and, uh, and he had her at the mother's house where he was painting. He had, to, he had loads up that he was painting and Harold Newton was there. Uh, Robert Stab was there, and, and Sam Newton was there also. So when I went there and I showed him my work, he said, what you got? And I showed it to him, he said, how long it took you to do something like that? So I told him, he said, well, I'll be through with these tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I found out how much money could be made from that, it just turned me on, you know. My mother did not want him, well, she didn't mind him painting, but she told him that he needed to choose some other profession you know, that would pay him a salary. She had no idea at the time that the painting would pay off as well as it did. Uh, but after, like, after I after started selling the painting, and maybe one a week, then two a week, and so forth, you know, and started making the money, uh, that made her change her mind. <laughs> His dream was to have a black elder rock. And, and he set a goal for it. And he had pictures lined up on the wall. Mm -hmm. And he set his goal that night when he paint, he what look at that picture, he see that car. And that car just give him the inspiration to keep on going and, until he did it. They had seen how easy it was for Florida's premier landscape artist of that time, Beanie Backus. Uh, they saw how easy it was for him to paint up a painting, get two or three hundred dollars for a painting. So some of them did that. 
and uh, they threw together some very inexpensive 24 inch by 36 inch paintings and they took them out on street corners and started selling them for 15 20 bucks in the beginning he uh, would load the pictures up in his car and go from place to place selling them all over Florida. Uh, and after he started selling, making a little money, he decided to hire some people to help him work. And uh, he would uh, paint the pictures and send them out to, to sell. When they saw what, uh, what Alfred and Harold Newton were doing, then it just changed some of the people's minds as far as doing what they were doing and started drawing and started painting. My favorite story is Ellis Buckner went to the orchard to see his brother George and their dad who were picking oranges. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a wad of fives and tens and he said, I made this painting. George said it was a wad of fives and tens big enough to choke a horse. And he said, I got down off of that picking ladder and I never picked another orange from that day on. I would say today, picking that fruit had a lot to do with me learning to paint. <laughs> you know, and that was unheard of for a black person to paint at that particular time um, because the only work that black people could do at that particular time was a field work, yeah, they, you know, a uh, farm. Uh -huh. We worked at a farm or something like that. There, there wasn't a variety of jobs out there. Uh, they used to take and pick by the piece, so they got 10 cents a basket. So. In a day, they made uh, a person who didn't know how to do anything made five dollars. <laughs> well, not me. I made three fifty. <laughs> I mean, I, I never forget. I tried to make five dollars. I could not make five dollars when I went to that field. My aunt was out there, and she could make thirty-five dollars a day, and that was a lot of money and that, in the fifties. Yeah. But yeah. I could only make three dollars and fifty cents. So Alfred hired guys to make frames. He was painting so fast that he couldn't meet the demand, so he hired guys to take them out and sell them. We used to, <laughs> we used to use, uh, take a thinner and break the, uh, the roof and tar down. Mm -hmm. And we came up with the, uh, uh, well, you can make it look black walnut, whatever color you want it. The more thinner you put in, the, the lighter the, uh, the tar would get. So we would rub the tar in and, and wipe it down, wipe it off, and rub a little gold on it, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, you, you know, you could buy a gallon of tar for the cheap. Uh -huh. A gallon of thinner, and I mean, you had more thin you didn't use for a year or two, you know, <laughs> more than that. And uh, we just, hey, wipe that, you wipe that stuff on there and then wipe it off with a cloth and uh, put your little gold in here and uh, we was gone, hey, <laughs> first class. He didn't have any supplies to, uh, to uh, uh, paint, so he used anything that was not nailed down. Uh, like old boards that were around the house, he would paint on that. In my case back then, I, I think I used the, uh, the Upson board because back, back then you can get a whole sheet four by eight. It was uh, about two or three dollars back then at that time, and which wasn't bad when the piece of canvas would cost you a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so you can cut that thing up and get a lot of pictures out of it. And, uh, white lead instead of buying white paint at the time. <laughs> but I think that's how I kind of learned to mix paint because even back then just buying buying the paint was kind of kind of expensive back then. So we used look color and did a lot of mixing. In the early 70s or uh, the late 60s we were down there and uh, that's when we was putting that stuff on uh, that cardboard right there. And uh, I had a uh, I had a lady, we had the stuff sitting around on the ground and all of that. And the lady came by and said, Y'all got some nice work. Say, if you uh, would put that stuff on canvas, you probably would have something there. And, uh, and then next year, we had transferred it, went over to canvas. And uh, boy, look at that. I mean, everything, 
we made it, everything change. The people loved the work that Alfred Hare and Harold Newton were doing. And we liked it too, but the market was in the white area. And this is how he made the money. This is how I made my money. But you know what? Uh, it was in the white area, but Alfred had a skill for talking there. He could talk you into buying that painting. It, not me, <laughs> but he could talk you into buying that painting. And then he would, he, he, I remember sometimes he would take a painting to a, a person's house. And they say, oh, well, it, it, it doesn't match what I have here. He said, that's all right, I can fix that for you, you know. <laughs> and uh, somebody told me one time, there's, I, I never, never told me this, that um, I painted a picture one time and it had a, a cow in the painting. And the lady said, oh, no, this would never work with my, my uh, living room. You know, I, that cow doesn't uh, work. He said, okay, I can fix it for you. And they, they say, Alfred went outside, you know, and covered the cow up, you know, with a little bit of paint and came back and sold the lady the painting. And I met Mr. Gibson about four years ago when he came into our office uh, showing some of his paintings, mm -hmm. which I fell in love with. And I finally saved enough money to buy my first one. I believe it was that one there, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Good Which one? one? Yeah, the Thank smaller you. one. Um, Mr. Gibson had told me that this was uh, done uh, west of town, out by the Adams Ranch, I believe. Right. Right. And to me, it just looked like the locale in the area, and that's why I really fell in love with it. And then I mentioned that I like water. Uh -huh. I'm drawn towards the water, and that's when he started uh, showing me the various paintings with water in it. Uh, this one up here is of Indian River Drive. Okay. And it looks exactly like it. That runs along the Indian River. Mm. What I like is I just sit here and it's very calming to me because mm. it's, a, it's, you know, all of the area here, which I love. When Mr. Gibson brought this one in, it mm -hmm. just looks like a typical Florida sunset. Okay. And again, I just know, I'm one of my many times out on the river on, on the boats with my friends, I just know that I've been in this spot. <laughs> <laughs> it just brings back a lot of good memories. When she bought the first painting, I almost knew what she liked, and when she purchased that particular painting, she kind of mentioned she she liked water, uh, the more the pine trees, and by me hearing that, I could almost know that she going to buy the next painting because I tried to paint what she said she liked. I sold this one down there. Oh. So the uh, the fellow what <coughs> what what uh what bought it, he wanted. The water hyacinths. Oh. Yeah, he wanted to put some of them in. So I brought it in to put some of them in. So uh, I, I just, you know, hmm. completed it. So uh, in this show, you know, I think I'm a deliberate uh, kid, take it down. When I entered that show, I made about, about $800. And back then, uh, $800 $800, <laughs> which was a lot of money. But I sold most of my uh, Florida scenes. So that's what I turned to. I I, I turned, to, you know, paint all Florida. I, at the time, that's what was selling. And so I said, well, hey, I guess I'll, I'll stick to what's selling. So mm -hmm. there are some obvious niches that you find. You know, you do a duck. If you get good response over it, then you tend to to work on that theme a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, wild turkeys was a, was a theme that I found. So I started painting wild turkeys and uh, when I did, um, I could never keep enough of them. They are, they are the single type of wildlife painting that I know to this day that you can sell every day and Sunday too. Florida is Florida regardless of who's doing it. But uh, it, and what, what makes the difference is how, you know, we're accent all this stuff, you know. Yeah. And I think we all, whatever we do, we all gonna have a little bit different touch anyway, so uh, it ain't gonna come out the same. It's one thing to be a painter and paint beautiful things and have people that love it and collect it, but to take your work and actually have it become part of a historic era or document. That's, that's uh, for me, a lot more interesting and rewarding. I wanted to document all of the things that I loved and I knew about the woods and waters around Florida and the tradition of James Audubon doing the birds you know, of America and 
and preserving something that was in transition. For years, back in that area, wasn't sure wasn't nothing back there but uh, on this old uh, dirt road and uh, and in the river. That's pretty much it, mm -hmm. which was real nice. But now they you got a lot of condos and all kind of stuff that's being built back in there, now. Mm -hmm. and they're pushing out a lot of that. So. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to move to higher ground. <laughs> <laughs> I love water, even though I can't swim. The clean water, you know, I, I love it. And it's, it gives me a lot of peace a lot of times, you know. Even just like right now, I love this part of life. When I can hear God talking through the trees and through the water, it's consoling. I'm up at 6 o'clock in the morning, so I get to see the different colors in the sky. And you have your oranges, your green, your blues, all of it right there. They're not just something I made up on the canvas. It's there looking at you. The clouds, you get, you get the dark clouds or the, the stormy clouds and sunsets, you know. And it's just, it's there. And you can look, go just turn around and every time you turn in the circle, you see these different colors. It changes all around, all the time. In that particular area, how the trees cover the um, the water, and just it's something like a hideaway, and then you can look out and you see the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And what happened, I just wanted to get that particular feeling. I, I get very in love with the trees, and I heard on the news last night where some, oh, land developer pushed up a whole lot of historical trees and I, I you know what that bothered me when I saw it you know and say he'll plant a hundred more but that doesn't matter it's not the same then I decided that one person is not enough to be here to record all this he's disappearing too fast I can't get around to all parts of the state so I put a team of eight artists together we went Swanee River is 250 miles long we uh, canoed like 30 miles of it one day, and we, some of us took boats, but we covered the whole river, uh, took pictures, and then documented the river in painting. How can I impress upon others that we need to save this beauty? And doing the painting and taking it, showing it was, a, was an excellent way. First thing I have to psych myself out. So you don't just paint. The pain, you have to take and get it that feeling so you get into it. And when you're doing a painting that, that is turning out real good, it seems like you go further and further into it. When you get into the feeling of the painting, of what you're trying to accomplish, and you see yourself doing it, mm. it's really, uh, I get a real good feeling from that. You got the feel and thank Mr. you know you got to have that Mr. feeling mm -hmm. that, you know that great feeling you so uh, when you go at it and start the pain uh, like I say before you start you you need to mentally you need to be there you know thinking of uh, that type of morning or uh, whatever uh, if not that have your good guide some photographs mm. you know so mm -hmm. I usually wait till I get the I can get that feeling, get the, get the spirit, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked pretty good for me. As far as drawing, I don't really think about really drawing, which I think I could draw, but uh, I think of it as more like billing, you know, because this is what you're doing. You, you're working out of the dark, up to the light. Well, right now I'm trying to uh, get in some of my, uh, my highlights in. As far as the light and uh, trying to make it sing, really, what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is the lizard crimson, mm -hmm. and this is the cadmium red light. It's the cadmium orange light. I love my bright oranges and my yellows. And I, I just love them. I love the grays and all this stuff, too. But basically, the sunsets, I was a freak for sunsets. Right in here, there's a, a spot right in here I need to work on. And, uh, and I could do it with color and, and pull it, or either pull it this way or uh, put something there. Mm. So I'm thinking uh, what would, would be nice there would uh, be some uh, some dead wood in this area, out of this area. Mm. 
And if I decide to do it differently, which is another area, would be right here somewhere. I use one like this for a lot of, when I have a whole lot of, of the same thing to do, but it still have to be refined back to the, mm -hmm. to the smaller brushes. I use also, I use this paint knife here. I use this one a lot. And I use this. I think when I first met Harold, he was using one like this, but I use this now basically to mix paint, mix the paints with. I don't know if you ever did a lot of fishing, sitting there watching, waiting on that cork to do that number there. And uh, with the painting, uh, you know, you're kind of in the same boat here, but the deal is uh, you got to think ahead all the time because you're looking for uh, finished products. I try to visualize that as I go, you know, so I try to see it mentally, you know. And this part here gets gets a little rough because I got some big hands. You notice how I, how I approach this thing. I always start to move before I get to it. <laughs> yeah, I always get myself going. I get, I get into the swing, you know. The more pressure I apply to this brush, the, uh, the more paint I'm getting. I don't need but a few strands across that. I've got to bring all the light in in the proper places and all this got to be redone mm -hmm. or finished. It's incomplete. Like we noticed around my clouds, I got to cap them. I got to put more light effect in the clouds and my tree limbs and branches, they got to be mm -hmm. outlined and highlighted. And when it's finished, it'll be closer to a natural look of life than what it is right now. It satisfied me to sit down here and do a good piece. You know, uh, I get a, I get a big kick out of that to do something that I feel really good over. Then uh, just sit up and just just paint something. Right? I like to feel good over it. I like playing a good piece of music. I've been uh, collecting Florida art. Basically, my interest went to Florida art. Then I read an article about uh, the highwaymen in the Palm Beach Post about a year and a half ago, and uh, it piqued my interest. And they said, well, you know, you can find these things here and there, garage sales, flea markets, whatever. So I said, well, let's check it out. And sure enough, found uh, some pieces that we thought we liked, so we brought them home. So then I started putting out a little more money and hanging more and more on my walls, and it's become kind of a, a fanaticism. If you ever saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where that guy just builds that, that devil's tower over and over again because he's like kind of possessed, well, that's the way I feel. All of a sudden, I feel like I haven't bought one this month. I have to go out and look and see what's out there. I found this one in a veritable junk shop in Fort Pierce. When Ann and I went in, uh, we asked the lady if she had any Florida paintings, and she said no. And we discovered this thing back in the corner covered with dust, and I asked her about that. She said, well, if you want it, I'll sell it for a buck. And uh, we had to do a lot of cleaning and some in painting, but still one of my personal favorites. A friend of ours called me uh, last year and told me that uh, her brother was down in the Miami area at a flea market. And there were two paintings, and he knew they were, because he's from Fort Pierce too, so he knew they were my brother's painting. And asked the lady, oh, how much do you want for those old paintings over there? She said, well, just give me $10 for each one. He said, okay, and so he said, gosh, I made me a good buy, you know. And afterwards, he asked the lady, he said, do you know who this painting belonged to? She said, no. She said, but this, he told him, this artist is dead, now this painting is worth a lot, a lot of money. And the lady wanted to buy it back for $100 each. He would not sell them to her. In fact, he would not even let me have those paintings. And uh, I like to say, too, that I will not part with my painting for any amount of money. And now their work is hot. It's the hottest art in Florida now. There's it's not the most expensive either it's the kind of art that people can buy and put in their living room and and uh, it's just it's florida folklore they're true artists and they're true entrepreneurs they're what a lot of people dream of being but they went out and did it they they went out and found something that was wanted and gave it to the people and made a living doing it it was a matter of surviving raising seven children if the painting didn't go fast enough, I did what I had to do. Cutting yards, it didn't really matter. Cutting yards, painting houses, or digging ditches if I had to. 
But thank God I haven't had to dig the ditches. <laughs> Art is, is one of those uh, uh, elements that in a society that is, is, it transcends all different kind of difficult differences that people have. Mm -hmm. You know, we were doing things I think that people related to. The language was clear. Uh, the language was the same that they had in their heart and mind evidently because mm -hmm. that's what happens when people respond to something on that, that mm -hmm. level. You know? mm -hmm. they, uh, the, high, the other highwaymen, from what I understand, some of them made quite a bit of money, so that must have been a prolific market out there. <laughs> and uh, I raised nine kids, so something good happened. When I got this letter out real proud. This particular letter uh, that I got from Hubert Humphrey, he wasn't an uh, art critic, but he liked my work. He said, I feel that him himself say, it's a good painting, I feel that I'm a really an artist. To me, I was one of the black, first black artists that had a painting in the White House. We never knew that the market would be today what it is today. We never knew that we would be recognized like we are being recognized today. And it's going to get even better. I've sold paintings out of here, like I don't know what. It's been, it's been nice, though. It's been real good. I say that, though. It's been been real nice and uh, I probably would be uh, be paying from here on in you know until uh, till they ring that bell. <laughs> it would come to the point if I didn't ever sell another one I still paint. I get joy out of it you know. And I'm looking to paint one masterpiece before I leave this side. <laughs>